past summer, I think. And, you know, I just was curious as to what the retired players sort of looks like. And there's a huge gap. So mm-hmm. there's literally barely anybody who's retired in the last eight years there. Right. And it's mainly guys who've been retired for like over 10, 12, 15 years from that future generation. Well, one of those guys came up to me and he was like, look, man, the truth of it is you guys have been a bit smarter about your off the court business than we had. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the goal, I think, is to continue that trend with the players that are coming beyond us, just keeping them or yep. allowing them to know that you can be informed about other aspects of what's going on out here in the world. You don't have to necessarily depend on other people's words to sort of get an understanding. You, know, you can have some confidence to go out and find out information for yourself yep. um, because ultimately it's going to enrich you holistically, your whole person. And like I said, I've, I've always, I've made more relationships. I made more relationships in the NBA as a sort of, as someone who, is is himself right i never had to like try to fit into this box right. and people and people have and it, it surprises me sometimes like who looks at me or who knows me or who's like watching up you know keeping up on me you right. know when i retired like literally like i retired the first or second text i got was from brad stevens and i was uh, like her right it right was like dude wrote me this huge text and you know, it basically was like, man, I've been a fan of yours for years. Stay in touch. I thought, you know, it was, and he and I have actually communicated something. It's weird. Yeah. I'm like, man, but you never know who's watching. You never know yeah. who's appreciating you from afar, from a distance. Yeah. And I think if you, if you're one-sided, if you're not able to sort of show multiple parts of yourself, you limit yourself. For sure. You know? So I think that's a, that's an important piece for, for young athletes to, to take, this, especially from a guy like you. Right, who's had the yeah, on yeah, court yeah, success, yeah, yeah, yeah. having yeah. off court success, yeah. but you yeah. you don't necessarily fit into that. He looks like this other guy, or he, you know, thinks like this other guy because you have the ability to do it. You know, you take pride in being able to yeah. find those things for yourself. Yeah. And I think that's the issue. Uh, we go to our youth sports. Like we've been trying to tackle that for forever. Oh, like yeah. um, I got a close friend who's uh, high high ranking in the Naval Academy, and uh, he's a, he's like a like a leadership type so he'll work for like google or something in, in their leadership uh, in a leadership role and teamwork and all that stuff like black right. dude too right smart dude love him to death and he's like yo man you gotta get these athletes to say they money and obviously i'm on game mode still it's a game alarm but uh <laughs> but, yeah he's like you gotta get athletes to do this do that i'm like listen man the problem is is that by the time we get a hold of them like the, the ones that make most of the money brainwash because somebody and picked them up at 12 years old and said, let me run all your endeavors and you just handle the basketball side. So, like, we got to figure out a way to get to our youth sports, too, because now we're, we're trying to build these. That's another part of the mental part, too, is, like, we're building these athletes saying, all right, you're going to be a professional basketball player and I'm going to live in this house and you're going to live in this house and we're going to do these things and you're training them at 6 a.m. every day. And this is from like age 10, man. I'm like, I'm seeing like the best eight year old in the country. I'm like, yo, for one, you're five, two, and his mom's four eleven. He's not gonna play in the league. Right. And the ones that do make it, like I know this one kid, he's going pro, man. Like, but I know some factors that are gonna derail him. And I'm like, yo, man, he's gonna struggle, man, because this person got a hand and this dude's gonna fall in love with the game. And then right. when they fall in love with the game, it's like the game was all they knew this whole time. And when I see the kid, I'm like, what you doing in school? kind of grades you get it don't bullshit me man like you got to get your grades up like basketball easy that's gonna come but you get this right you're gonna be a way better basketball player try to tell them something like that because i know like man his situation with those involved they're gonna they're gonna try to take advantage of it and he's gonna be lost and then he ain't gonna like basketball and then when you ain't got basketball you don't really have nothing else how is it important is it is it for young people to work on decision making right so you're talking about and for those who don't understand what i'm just talking about I think you're talking about when kids are identified young. A kid, yeah. you can see a kid that's 10, 12, 13 years old, and then all of a sudden people start attaching themselves to this kid with the expectation that this kid is going to continue on, blow up. When he blows up, they're going to be a part of the, 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 the entourage, the team that gets a piece of this, yeah. of this, this pie that this kid is chasing. Yeah. So how, is, how important is it to teach kids the importance of making good decisions and how do they 
start making those decisions, you know, about who they hang out with, who they allow into their right. circle. Right. And particularly right. when mom and dad are yes. mom and yes. dad are in the dark. Right. So that that was a really good question because like like I made mistakes, but I wasn't like highly touted. So like, you know, anybody really see it, like just goofy right. kid stuff. Like being now there's a difference between being a sixteen year old and you playing around and like we egg houses, do goofy stuff like that, as opposed to like you got to be careful, like, you know, you get in the car with the wrong OG because the OG want to help you out. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. One thing kids need to know, like, nothing's for free, you know, and I, I, and I think, like, that's not, like, you and I, we know, like, you told me the story about, you know, a famous person coming up to you, like, do you want to work for me on the side when you were young? You're like, my mom said I right, can't right. do this. Like, we right. were raised like that. Like, I was raised the same way. Mom, right, like, right, right. If my mom's finding out about this, I might die. Like, I'm afraid. <laughs> like, 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 when these kids are like coming up it's like they're they're being told like you going to the league you ain't really got to worry about that and then they start really believing it so like they start taking things and start accepting stuff not knowing it's gonna come back on you man like you you're gonna be guilted in this relationship for the rest of your life like, right right you about to enter into a 30-year relationship Right. Uh, and it's going to be like, so like, this is like real lives being affected because you're going to have to, it's going to be some hard, like you're going to have to cut it off the hard way at some point, or you're just going to be guilted and taking care of another human being who really has no care or interest for you. So right. it's all about like the decision making on that point, but at the same time, patience, like patience is like, I think that's an over, overlooked word, very underrated. Right. People don't right. put respect on it. So like, I learned that it's like, like, I didn't really take no loans as a rookie. You know, what I'm hell saying? no, like, right? You know, I knew, right? I ain't, <laughs> I ain't take no money from no agents. Like, I ain't right. take no money. Like, for one, I didn't know that like, I was that good, so I was wasn't expecting nothing. You know, so I didn't ask. But looking back, I'm like, man, I ain't take no money from nobody. Like, I grinded. Like, I didn't need no big house. I didn't need three cars. Like, I was, I was just happy to be hooping. And then right. when I finally got it, I was a more of appreciation for it. Right. But when these guys are getting it young, they just get accustomed to that lifestyle, which is gonna hurt them. Or, like, you know, they're going to get involved with the wrong person who's going to take advantage of them. And then it's, eventually it's going to come back to haunt you. And that's right. what patience is all about. Just, like, wait. When it comes, it's supposed to come, man. Like, just enjoy. Like, I always tell kids, man, enjoy being 13. Enjoy being 16. Even enjoy being 19. Like, you tell a rookie in the league, like, man, just enjoy. you young. You ain't got no kids. You can go out right. and have fun. Like, you don't need nothing. All this crazy stuff. And everybody know how much money you got already. You ain't got to show them you got it. That, right, that's right. the other one too. Like, man, just be patient. Like, you, everybody right. know how much money you got. Like, why you got to prove to me that you can afford that watch? You really can't right. afford it, first of all. So just wait on it. And, and I would say, you know, right now that's magnified the fact that players need to account for these sorts of things, you know, because even, even the NBA can be interrupted unexpectedly. You got to exactly. be prepared for that. How's and, your, and that's, go, ahead. go ahead. No, I was going to say, I was going to ask you something about your health, but go ahead. No, no, I was just saying, he, two things he touched up on. Uh, the first one was, uh, like, that check-to-check the check thing. Like, we're going through it right now, and they about to shut this. They shut it down, and, you know, uh, the league is very, very smart, and the, the league is very good at putting information out there. So, they're like, the NBA is going to pay their players on April 15th. Right. People are like, look, are they doing right by their players? It's like, listen, <laughs> man, we, we play 80% of the games already, right. but we only right. got 40% of our checks. Right. What industry do you know? <laughs> you, you work and did your job, and they going to negotiate how much of that money and when it dispersed the work that you already did. Right. So right. I've been trying to explain that. He's like, man, the NBA still paying you. Are you still getting your check? I'm like, no, nah, man, that was from work I already did. Two, three, <laughs> nothing, dog. Like, right, right, they right. Were catching up, dog. I'm on a yearly schedule. So we all we, we laugh about that. But at the same time, to be serious, is like, you know, I always look at our, you know, being in the, on, in, with the union, it's my duty to, look out for the best interest of the players. You know, the league is getting younger and younger. We got more guys in the league that are in the first four years of the contracts with smaller contracts. Right. So, you know, they might be more um, likely to live check by check, you know, just because they're on smaller contracts and, the, the you know, they're trying to figure this, everything out. So, uh, you know, those guys might be affected and we got to keep that in mind, just making sure that our body is, is, is good in terms of financially and, you right. uh, Missing, missing money might hurt them a little bit more than, than you know, some of the other guys. Right. And it's not just this season. I mean, to, to talk a little bit about the salary cap and your role within the union, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously with this lost revenue from, from work stoppage as well as, you know, what happened at the beginning of the season, you know, now you could be looking at a flattened cap for the next couple of years. So guys that might have been looking at 
escalating contracts. Exactly. Um, Exactly. Now you exactly. you may not have that. The exactly. market may not be there exactly. for you. You know, like a guy like like Tristan Thompson, had he right. been a, a free agent two years ago, probably would have signed a 20 plus million dollar a year deal. Exactly. Now you're looking at a guy who is maybe a mid-level exception if he doesn't do a sign and trade with the Cavs. Exactly. Or he, or he has, you know, a lot of guys are going to do one year deals. People don't realize, you know, some people may not realize how important the playoffs are. You know, when we talk about the playoffs, a lot of guys are like, we don't get play- paid for the playoffs. You know, the owners make a bulk of their money on the playoffs. Mm-hmm. And I always rebuttal that by saying, no, the playoffs actually are the largest marketing spin in terms of advertisements uh, for, for the league sponsors. And, you know, the finals bring in so much revenue on that end. That in turn raises BRI, which in turn re- increases the salary cap into the following season. So it's mm-hmm. almost it's like you're, it's almost future income. And you got to look at it that way. Yep. And uh, I think that's why you hear a lot about the possibility of playoffs because the playoffs are very important. And even the owners want a higher cap because the owners always talk about we want to be able to spend and compete. Uh, and then when you got owner spending, when there's a, when there's, when the salary cap comes in a little bit lower, you're going to have more teams. You're going to have more teams over the tax. So there's incentives on all the way around, uh, which is why I'm pretty optimistic about, you know, how the, uh, the NBA works with the union, the union works with the, with the NBA in terms of, you know, making sure that we work really well together to, to take care of each other. I would say that the, the NBA and the MPPA, I mean, you guys are sort of the gold standard right now mm-hmm. within sports uh, with how you guys collectively work to make the game better because it is in the best interest of both parties rather than an NFL and an NFL PA where it's a very adversarial relationship, which maybe sometimes stifles the growth of the league. I think you have two, you, you have two people in leadership roles um, that uh, don't have egos. I think uh, Adam Silver's very forward thinking and Michelle Roberts, she's not the normal, okay, this I'm running the show and don't try to screw us over. I think they work very well together. They have uh, very uh, open uh, lines to communication to one another, and 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 they uh, explore every avenue to make sure that you know both sides are in agreement. And, and and the best negotiations are when both sides feel like they didn't lose. And I think that's right. the goal that they look at when 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 they go to uh, have an issue or try to overcome uh, something that's like coming up right now so Dre I got two sort of two off the cuff questions the first one is just generally man I I call these fail up moments I think that we all have moments in our lives in our journeys particularly NBA guys like guys who have made that step right Um, we had a moment where we came up short or we failed but ultimately it was like a fail up moment because at that very low moment something something clicked what, what was that moment for you, um, uh, if you have one that you're willing to, 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 to share with our, uh, our listeners? A fellow, I feel like I've had a, a good amount of those. Uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, I feel like, because I always look at them differently. Like, I, 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 look, I read a lot of different things, and it's always like failure is not responding when something didn't go your way. You know what I mean? Like, right. like something like that's, and I was talking to my trainer yesterday, uh, was it this morning? We were boxing earlier this morning. And I was like, the problem with a lot of people is they have, like, I have a problem with people who are, who are criticizing an athlete and be like, if I had that much money, I would never be out of shape. And my right. thought is, as a human being, you should never be out of shape. That says a lot about you more than the athlete. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Like, right. that blows my mind. So in terms of, I'm talking about just you go back to your question in terms of felon, like I never looked at it as like felon. It was just like, I think it was just like, I was just happy to be in a situation and I look forward to it. Like, right. man, I can't wait to be in some pressure. Like right, right, right. that's cause I put the work in. So I was like, man, I've worked my ass off. Like, shoot, I hope I get the opportunity. Cause what other reason, like, what's the point of working out hard? If you ain't gonna, if you ain't gonna be in a situation where you can prove that you've been working hard, right. you know what I'm saying? So I think in college, uh, that helped me a lot. Oh, my college, my rookie, my whole freshman year of college was actually hilarious looking back. Luke Walton used to bust my ass every day mm. in practice. Okay. And I'm like, this <laughs> slow, this slow ass white dude cannot uh-huh. move, dog. I'm way faster than him. His ain't he always spraining his ankle. He right. always was like hurt or something. Like, but in practice, I'm like, how is he getting positioned like this? Right. Like, how is he making this pass? Like, people always ask me, you know, you got good core vision. I learned how to pass watching Luke Walton. 
I'm like, yo, wow. this dude is incredible. Somebody always open when he passed to him. Or when, right, he, right. when he passed to them, they always open. Oh. So, like, he used to have me in a block in the post. I could not guard him in the post. I'm like, yo, this dude weak as hell. Like, I don't see why everybody thinks he's so good. <laughs> and I still didn't get it. But then after my freshman year, um, I got fine. And then when I got to the league, I got it. I'm like, ah, oh, that's right. what he was doing. And that's why he played for so long. And he played a long time in the league. Like, right. Who else with his athletic abilities? Like, how many dunks did he have in his career? Like, four? Right. right, <laughs> right. Eight. But, like, you know, he got a couple chips. And, like, he actually contributed. Like, he wasn't just on the team. Like, he, Phil Jackson put him in the game. Like, right, like right, when Steve Kerr right. put me in the game, hey, man, get us the float, man. Get the ball. He, Phil Jackson put in Luke Walton with Kobe Bryant. Like, yo, get him right. Right, right. Yeah, you know, I think, like, just failing every day to somebody, I had no idea why he was out playing me like not like not like outworking me just outplaying me I didn't get it but but my my sophomore year like I took like leaps and bounds in terms of my basketball knowledge and you know my that kind of like that point four skill set yeah that I mean that we all have those moments I'm just I just think that when people can hear them from Mm -hmm. different people particularly young people young people are constantly in this in this fail moment like things are just for some guys things just aren't working and I think it's always good for them to hear that people have gotten through different moments, you know, like again, a whole year of having yeah. to match up with somebody in practice yeah. that is getting the best of you, but you didn't, yeah. it didn't divert you or knock you off path. And you know what that helped me with though? I don't want to expand on that. So like Lou Olson was like the, he was like the king of like fundamentals, right? right. And these kids, you take it for granted. Like we would spend 30 minutes a day on ball handling. You know what I'm saying? Like when did right. you ever work on your ball handling skills in the league, like in practice? Not till yeah. I got to the Warriors. Doing right, the damn, right. <laughs> right, right. But other than that, you don't work on your ball. But in Arizona, every day it was like that was the worst part of practice was the ball handling. I'm like, yo, this how it hurt to dribble. Right, right. But I've never had handles like I had in college. Right. And like this goes back to talking about Luke Walton. It made me appreciate those fundamentals drills, like the pivots, all right. the pivots, all the b- ball handling drills. You know, all the, uh, I'm going to square you up. I'm going to jab you. We had certain fundamentals in Arizona. Like, we can only drive middle. Right. Uh, you couldn't drive baseline. You couldn't spin because once you spin, you expose yourself to the defense where you can't see them. Like, little stuff like that. In my freshman year, I'm goofy. A goofy freshman. I'm, like, right. not taking that serious. I'm, like, what? And I'll spin on purpose. But then, like, this, this white dude killing me every day, and then you start figuring out, like, oh, he only drive middle. Or if he do go baseline, this is why. Right. Now, because right. I'm watching him because he's killing me. I'm, like. Oh, that's what that's that's where the fail turned into. Like, okay, I got to do this, and right. I got to do this. And then when I got to the league, I started seeing tenure vets that couldn't do shell drill. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, that's why we was waking up doing shell drills early in the morning. Okay. Right. 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 <laughs> they, they they don't know right, the basics. Right. That's good. Yep. All right. So the last thing I got, man, early two thousands, I was getting out of college. The whole mindfulness routine system things started coming and I, I I'm somebody that for a lot of years man I didn't get into a, a legit routine uh it wasn't until like maybe year three or four in the NBA that I seriously got a got a routine down but mainly it was how I was starting my day so you know just for our listeners man what what if any uh morning routine or one thing you do in the morning to start your day and that's hilarious you asked me that question. I just finished reading 5 a.m. Club. I finished oh, okay. it like two weeks ago, right? I read it in like a week and a half. Like, I got through that. Club, okay. 5 a.m. Club, right? He wrote, like, uh, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. He wrote that book, too. So, 5 a.m. Club uh, is like a uh, worldwide bestseller. So, he breaks down how your whole morning, the first hour of your morning should be. Your first hour dictates the rest of your day. And I tried it like once or twice. I wasn't waking up at 5 a.m., but I was just applying it to waking up at 7 a.m. Right. Man, it is spot on. So it's, he's saying like as soon as you wake up, like as soon as you wake up, mm-hmm. you should have workout clothes on like on the floor next to your bed. Because he, he says sleep and workout clothes, but I don't believe in that. Because uh, Ariana Huffington, she has a sleep thing she does. Uh, I invested in her Thrive company. It's on, on wellness. You okay. can't sleep in uh, workout clothes because your body's going to think you're going to work out while you're right. sleeping. Like, you know how the mind works. It's a crazy thing. Yeah. So your clothes should be on, the, your workout clothes should be on the floor. As soon as you wake up, throw them on and work out 20 minutes. Boom. You work out. Uh, right. 
anything. Just work out 20 minutes, boom. And it talks about how it wakens uh, your endorphins and it gets the mind like in a state where you like, you just waking up, right? So you work out for 20 minutes. Then the next 20 minutes is all like meditative or spiritual. You know, maybe you read the Bible or whatever it is you read. Uh, and you do a little prayer uh, and then you're just like meditating. And you're thankful for being awake and you're just like, you're coming down from that high you just got and there's the door from working out and you're just being thankful. Like, just like reflect for 20 minutes. And then the next 20 minutes is like you writing down, you planning out your day. Like this one I'm accomplished today. Uh, you're like looking that. over your schedule. You're doing all these things. The book breaks it down, right? And it talks about uh, you don't look at your phone. You don't look at an email. You don't look at no text. None of that during this time. Because they, they say when you look at the news or a text as soon as you wake up, it actually depresses you because most of the time you're looking at the news, it's always something bad or it, it right, takes your right. mind. It talks about right. your mind only has so much output that it can have. That's how you get tired as the day goes on. You know, people right. need that coffee break four times a day. Right. They get tired because their brain is working so hard. Right. You work out as soon as you wake up, it, it, it makes your brain bigger. It's called neuroplasticity. Like, so your brain actually grow. Your brain is actually mm -hmm. a muscle broken okay. down. Like it's like you working your hamstring, you building your hamstring. You can build your brain. So when you work out in the morning, you're actually building your brain to be able to take more in mm. so it doesn't get as tired. When you get to work and you start bringing it, it breaks the whole thing down. I'm like, yo, this book is on point. Yeah. So now, like, on days where I don't do nothing or I wake up and right. I'm like, it's like 8, 9 o'clock, I, like, I feel like shit. I'm like, man, I just wasted the day. It's only 9 o'clock, right. but I'm like, right. man, I done wasted my day because I ain't right. do what I was supposed to do. But it talks about you just build on 1% every day. Because it takes, I think you said it takes... uh six weeks to build a habit or something like that right. yeah and six weeks to build a habit so you're waking up at 6 a.m once you get that it's ingrained forever like you don't break it and then you say right. once you get that habit in you start another habit for six weeks and then like it's just said you incrementally get better one percent every day and people are like that ain't that much but over a year you better 365 percent over one year right, right like that book that book was cold man i'm like yo this book is this yeah, book is it. It yeah it was really good so Andre, I got one one more question for you to put a, a positive spin on on everything that's going on right now. What, what are you most looking forward to doing when we're allowed to go back out again? Golf. Man, like that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I just got. I'm glad you said that. I just got my golf club yesterday, like a new set yesterday, and I can't even use it. <laughs> they just. I be swinging in the house, man. I bought a net, and like I just be hitting my my two year old playing golf. So really. Yeah, she got it. Like she got it. Like she got a real nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so nice. Our uh, our new CMO Wendell Haskins. He's uh used to work at the PGA of America. Actually, he has his own yep. golf tournament too. So I bet you guys might have some some things in common on that front. But uh, I knew I seen Andre. you before too. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why. <laughs> he's also around the tech space. He's always at the the tech summit. The yep. All Star yep, Game. Yep. 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 Um, yep, yep. So. Um, but Andre, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, if you haven't already, you got to check out the sixth man, Andre Godala. Definitely a, a good read. And last thing I'll show you, just because I found it cleaning out my mom's house uh, in the winter or helping her clean up her house. I have a hologram rookie card of oh, yours wow. That's Arizona. from Arizona um, that, that I happened to just find <laughs> in, a, in a box of stuff my brother and I had. So, but thank you again for coming ago. on. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Dre. I appreciate, we appreciate you guys, you, man. man. Yes, no. sir. Thank you, man. <laughs>